Matthew, and then after Sure, uh, Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coalition for Access. Thanks for the briefing. I support the, 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 I'd like you to get back to this question of who the donors are, but I would wanted to ask you about the sort of the relative uh, attention paid to victims from different regions. In particular, for example, Boko Haram, it seems like, has a huge number of victims. I don't know, can you say what this region, I guess you can say it's a regional issue, how it's going to be represented in the conference, uh, what, your th what your thought is in terms of the sort of relative attention paid, not only by media, but even by the UN and the Security Council, to the number of victims uh, racked up by, by, by bombings in northern Nigeria and elsewhere, and what, what you think the UN and your center could, could do to bring more focus to this uh, ongoing outrage. Okay. Thanks, Matthew. Great question. Absolutely bang on in terms of what the conference is about. Um, in the first instance, as I mentioned, you know, we absolutely have to raise awareness of uh, the international community and particularly of governments to really what you might say uh, the, the deficit uh, when it comes to de terrorism and the fact that um, there are uh, literally thousands of victims, tens of thousands of victims actually. You mentioned in particular area, Northeast Nigeria, Boko Haram. Uh, you know, you remember the famous case of the Chibok girls who are still missing. Um, so they are not just those who die, but those who are kidnapped, those who are uh, enslaved, those who are raped, those who are, those are all victims. Um, and then their communities. Um, so, uh, you know, we are going to have in this conference all the governments, experts, regional representatives. Uh, Nigeria is absolutely uh, going to be represented there. Um, I myself have had meetings with the Nigerian uh, uh, ambassador just in the run-up to this conference. We're looking at doing specific things. So one of the things is the issue of capacity building. To come back to a very good question by our friend, what is the UN Counterterrorism Center doing? Its main role, it's not a talk shop, it's a capacity building role. There are resources that we have and they are modest. You know, governments have billions of dollars. We have to support, our mandate comes from the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy. Pillar three uh, is uh, capacity building. So what we're trying to do through the UN Counterterrorism Center is to provide technical assistance, capacity building at the national level, regional level and global levels to strengthen the capacities of countries in regard to core needs. So the area of victims, there's a lot more we can do. One just simple tool that we've now introduced, Secretary General himself launched, is the web portal that victims groups and member states can feed into so that in real time they have a resource. They can see what's available. But that's just a very small beginning. Uh, the idea of this conference is first to develop a, 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 a f an international awareness, but beyond that, a framework based on the report that the Special Rapporteur has, and then have some granular recommendations. So the outcome of this conference, the report that will come up, we hope will have concrete recommendations that member states and the UN, including our UN Counterterrorism Center, can take forward in helping governments. Of course, the primary responsibility is not the UN, it's governments that have to then take on nationally and at the regional level um, uh, programs that can really address the core needs the psychosocial, the medical, the legal, and other needs that, that victims uh, have, both as individuals and also collectively as victims' associations. Because in many countries, there are victims' associations, and, and sometimes their voices are very tepid. They're not well um, mobilized. And we, we want to help them mobilize their voices in a very constructive and positive way. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Abdul Hamid Sayam from Al-Quds Al-Arabi. Thank you for coming for this briefing. I have two questions. In fact, the first question, is the UN serious about bringing justice to its own staff who fell victims of terrorism? And if so, a number of my colleagues who were with me in Baghdad sued the United Nations because they felt that justice has not been done to them. And they've been complaining that the UN has neglected them not only physically, but also uh, morally. And, and, and one of the things that the major complaint by the victims, that they, they don't know the facts, what happened in 2003, August 19, in Baghdad. That's one question. The second, you know, Mr. Jahangir Khan, that there was no agreement on one single definition about what is international terrorism. And there are many reasons for that. And that's why in some influential power fled the General Assembly and came to the Security Council to impose their version of what is international terrorism. Now, in your opinion, if a people under occupation for almost 50 years, 
they have seen their land confiscated. Their homes had been bulldozed. A, a wall is being erected on their own land despite the ICJ opinion. Isn't that the, are those are victims of state-sponsored terrorism or not? How could the statement coming from the UN classify those young people who tried to defend themselves or out of despair, as the Secretary has said, that they tried to sometimes throw a stone at the occupation forces or have a knife? These things, how could they be classified as terrorism when occupation itself is not classified as form of state-sponsored terrorism? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, let me first on the second question. You know, the issue of definition of terrorism, and I think you were very articulate in explaining the, the challenges. Um, the, uh, you know, what this conference is about, it's a very practical focused conference on, on victims. There is no doubt a very large area when it comes to the broader issue of terrorism and how we define it. It's been ongoing discussion in the Sixth Committee in the General Assembly. I, it's been going on for years. Um, and that doesn't mean, it hasn't stopped the United Nations from being practical. We have a global counterterrorism strategy that was adopted by consensus in the General Assembly 10 years ago without a formal definition of terrorism. And in fact, the Secretary General has been producing reports every two years, and we are doing a lot of work in terms of helping countries shore up. One of the practical ways in which we approach it is that there are actually 19 international conventions that define different acts of terrorism. So there's one, one thing there. There are also Security Council decisions that are taken. I'll give you a very, one, very concrete example, Resolution 2178 that was adopted in regard to foreign terrorist fighters. Um, and there are measures being taken to address the issue of foreign terrorist fighters. So, um, you know, we have to do the best that we can based on what member states will allow the United Nations to do in terms of agreeing on what's the basis for the work of the United Nations. Um, if anything, this conference is far too late. We have to wake up to the issue of victims. If we wait for a definition, uh, good sir, we may never come to address the, 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 the human element of this. So, the, you know, we're not, we, you know, the Secretary General, through his reports, continues to push for best practices uh, and continues to be an advocate for better responses. This is a very good example where the Secretary General is pushing for a better international response to a very real need when it comes to terrorism. Um, on your first issue, you know, about state terrorism, not state terrorism, again, this is a definitional issue. It bedevils the politics of terrorism, if, you, if I may say so. Um, and again, the purpose of this conference is not ideally to end up with a political conference where we get bedeviled by the politics of terrorism. It is really focused at the end on the individual. What can we do, keeping in mind the points that you make about the politics of terrorism, how you define it, how you approach it. Every person, you may say, may have a different approach on any definition, on any particular issue. How difficult it is when it comes to terrorism. Um, so that's part of the ongoing discussion in terms of the broader dynamic. Uh, but that doesn't stop us tomorrow and beyond to really look at the human being that in the end is, the, is, the, is, 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 is affected. And this is where we have to do better in terms of impact. You know, there's a lot going on at the international level in terms of discussions, meetings, conferences, resolutions. But what difference is it making to the individual on the ground? This is something we have to ask ourselves. It is something the Secretary General feels very strongly about. We need to make a difference in people's lives, you know, not just in economic, social development, et cetera. When we advocate human rights, what could be more pertinent than the right of a victim who has suffered the worst attack? Because why? A victim is innocent. An innocent human being, you or I could be walking tomorrow, and including our UN colleagues, who could be hurt. We, we didn't do anything on terrorism, so they should be some framework for, for dealing with that, notwithstanding the larger politics that goes on and will continue for some time. So I hope that answers your question to some degree. Sorry about the first part, about UN staff. The UN staff, well, we absolutely are conscious. In fact, tomorrow we're going to have UN staff when we launch the web portal. This is something that the Secretary General and uh, all of us feel very strongly about, that the, 
Um, of course, we, we can't say that UN staff are more important than any victim. All victims, including UN staff, need the same degree of support, psychosocial, legal, practical. We have issues of reparations, and all of those are there. So we believe that they are part of the larger international community of victims. We have peacekeepers also, their families, etc., who are killed. You know, in Mali, there have been so many who have been killed. Baghdad, you mentioned, but since then, there have been so many attacks in, Bama, in Bamako, in Abuja, in Islamabad, in um, Mogadishu. Um, so the, the, the family of UN victims is part or going to be the beneficiary of this conference also, because this is addressing the whole panoply of issues that address all victims. We can't be selective when it comes to UN victims as opposed to others. So I think that that's why we will have UN victims in this forum also, so they can also be um, the beneficiaries of the outcomes of this conference. This may be a dicey question. Uh, I'm concerned about a case in which an act of terrorism could have been prevented, a beheading. I'm talking about the case of Jim Foley, whose family and the family of Steve Soloff uh, attempted to pay ransom to the terrorists. And they claim, and it's entirely possible, that they were threatened. Uh, by the White House and the State Department with prosecution for negotiating with terrorists. Now, uh, the Europeans have brought back many potential victims of terrorism alive. And what would you say to Mrs. Foley and Mr. Foley and the Solovs about the fact that their, the beheading of their sons could have been prevented if there were a different attitude toward handling the situation, the idea that that funds are being uh, accumulated by kidnapping uh, people, I think is a bit unrealistic. There are huge uh, funds being spent on, on supporting terrorist groups. I think Nizar has um, described a lot of that. But here you have a situation where a government prevented the saving of the life of a young man and will Mrs. Foley and Mrs. Soloff be considered victims of terrorism or victims of government policy? And yeah, well, no, thank you. That I mean, that's a uh, it's a very sad story. Um, I personally am not familiar with the specifics of that um, particular case, so it's not possible for me to comment uh, one way or the other in terms of the details. You do, though, however, raise a larger issue which is a very much a topic now in the counterterrorism community, which is the whole issue of kidnapping for ransom, what we call KFR, and what's the best approach to that issue. It's a very hard issue uh, because you have to address the very real needs of the families, uh, no matter which family we're talking about, um, of those who may be kidnapped. And then, of course, there's the larger issue of national policies that, that have you know, maybe a larger perspective. And reconciling that, this is an ongoing debate in the international counterterrorism community about how do you reconcile these two, um, if you like, priorities. Um, uh, you know, tomorrow's Victims Conference, some of these types of issues will come up. One of the themes of, uh, of, of the conference is, 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 you know, what can we do um, essentially to make victims and their rights really paramount? You know, we, 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 we raise their profile and we make sure that victims actually enjoy front and center um, priority of governments when it comes to um, making the hard choices of the kind that you, ma you mentioned. Um, so, you know, this is part of an ongoing debate, on part of an ongoing dialogue. Tomorrow's conference, some of these hard issues will come up. I'm not sure there are any easy answers to that, if I may say so, but um, it doesn't negate uh, the need to, to come up with a practical approach. Uh, I would say that each case sometimes can have its particular circumstances, and, and each government has its uh, sort of policies um, which, uh, which helpfully conference like this in building international norms may help to, to inform going forward. Uh, who, I mean, who is the victim in this case? I mean, who is the terrorist in this case? Jim Foley is dead. He was beheaded, I assume. Um, and it could have been prevented. Um, and the government interfered with, the, with saving his life. So who really killed him? Yeah, well, I don't have the details of that particular, so I, I, you know, I can't, again, I, it's not 
appropriate for me to answer that question because I don't know the details of, of that particular case. But I, you know, I, I do recognize the challenge that you're saying. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a very real human dimension, and this is what this whole conference is about, is bringing the paramounts, you know, we're talking about the rights of victims, not just the humanity, hum the rights, victims have rights. And so we have to champion those rights and make them part of the international policy framework from which governments will then feel that they have to, um, uh, in a sense, be accountable for. Okay. Yes, go ahead. My name is Ibsam Azim from Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper, Arabic newspaper based in London. I have a um, short question. You said it's uh, a little bit difficult to, um, or it's controversial to say who's, what's a terrorist attack or act, etc. Is there a definition then who's victim? I mean, on the opposite side, to try to find how you can um, solve this problem. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, the, the issue of, I mean, that's a very real point about the fact that we don't have, um, as such, um, a, a definition of, 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 of terrorism, and therefore, how do you define a victim of terrorism? Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, what we've tried to do uh, through this is to, to really um, uh, um, uh, ask uh, victims groups to, art to, to articulate for themselves. They know when they are the the targets of, of attacks that have taken place and where, you know, whole communities and individuals have been, have been attacked um, in terms of bringing together their voice. Now, um, you know, this is a challenge when you have to, um, if in fact they are challenged, are they victims or not victims? I, from my experience, practical experience, um, this, this issue is uh, never been a disabling factor when we come to having to address, in fact, by raising their voice and giving them um, an opportunity to present their case, because quite often victims are so silent that nobody even knows whether one is a victim or not. One has to give them a voice to be able to articulate that they are victims in the first place, because if they are not even recognized as victims because of maybe definitional issues or because of, let's say, neglect um, by governments, how will we ever um, know when there's a victim. You know, there's an attack on a school, so we know the immediate victims, but then there's a larger community that has been suffered, and if their voices are silent, their needs are not addressed, then not much is ever going to happen. You know, there's going to be a silent um, majority of individuals who are sitting out there, and if, uh, you know, if there's an argument raised, well, um, such and such person is not a victim because we don't define it. I think that epistemological um, uh, uh, approach is not the approach we want to go at. We want to take a very practical approach which goes around the issue of definition if we can and see how far we can get. Um, because if we have to start from the point of definition, as I said to an earlier question, I don't think we'll get into any meaningful practical action. And if I may say so, it may well be justified that if we don't have a victim, that a, a justification for paralysis. And I don't think that this is um, morally acceptable that because we can't have a definition, we can't do anything for victims. You know, so this is a half an answer to your very valid question. But this is an issue that we feel the time has come for mobilizing resources uh, to support um, victims, even if there is a challenge when it comes to definitional issues. I have just a follow-up question. So, would people be uh, able then to come to? you directly to the organization directly or it has to go through states or you don't know yet because it's in the uh, you are still um, consultating on this issue no I mean look the primary responsibility uh, will always remain with the government you know where the uh, uh, where government in the first instance where a, a terrorist attack occurs um, it's the United Nations you know doesn't have the capacity to respond to the needs of every terrorist attack. There's almost a terrorist attack, unfortunately, every day. Um, so it's, this conference is about you know, raising collective awareness in the first instance of governments, but also then beyond governments, you know, international regional organizations, civil society organizations, communities, as to what are the best practices. So this framework principle that Ben Emerson, this report that you have in your press kit, is a, it's a framework of engagement, 
um, at the national, regional, and global levels. Of course, there need to be mutually reinforcing actions. There may well be some interesting and important recommendations that come out of this conference that we may be then able to see can be implemented, including what role the UN may be able to take further. We're, 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 we don't, we're not yet there. So there may well be things that we can do in that context. Um, in fact, we have within our UN Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force a whole working group of relevant UN agencies looking at what can the UN do to support governments to address the needs of victims better. Because our role is we can only support governments um, in in, 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 in exercising their obligations to their citizens. Victims are citizens of their states. In fact, if anything, they are the, one of the most important uh, sectors uh, of, uh, of, of, of the citizenry that needs, that needs to have their needs better addressed. And this is the point of this conference tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khan. Uh, Go Kamoshida from uh, NHK, the Japanese public broadcaster. Uh, my question is uh, a little bit related to my colleague's one. Um, so do, do you think that there are some special approach in terms of support or protection of these uh, victims of the terrorism compared to the victims of the conventional crimes or even victims of accident or even of the natural disaster? Do you think, given that the terrorism is something special, maybe motiva politically motivated or even sometimes religiously motivated, do you think that there are some special approach to the victims compared to the other victims? <coughs> yes, no, I think that's a very good question. Um, you know, when a natural disaster occurs, you know, there's a whole machinery that gets into motion, including the UN. You know, we have a humanitarian response, there's an international community response. It's w fairly well developed. I'm not a humanitarian, so I don't want to speak out of line, but we can clearly see that when an earthquake attack occurs, you know, um, uh, or some other natural disaster, tsunami, a whole, human, a whole machinery kicks into motion, both at the national level and also at the international level. And there's been a lot of work gone, going, on, going on on the humanitarian front in that, in that sphere. In the area of victims of terrorism, we don't see that degree of machinery kicking into place. There is an immediate response, of course, first to get to kill that or to finish that terrorist attack off, and then to clean up, to apprehend and take the perpetrators of those actions to court. But then the communities that have been affected, we don't see the same kind of, if you like, disaster response. And you could argue, I mean, I don't want to be going too far, that where you have you know, you mentioned, some colleague mentioned Boko Haram, you know, major terror, or ISIS, what ISIS is doing. You know, ISIS today, let's not kid ourselves, is controlling huge areas, you know, huge cities. Um, uh, Mosul in Iraq, for example, millions of people, or at least hundreds of thousands of people are affected. Um, you know, whole minorities, girls, I mean, you name it, the whole sectors of society are being affected. Um, in a way, it's a disaster. This is another form of a disaster. Uh, it's a humanitarian disaster. I don't want to overplay that point. But do we have the international response, uh, and all, even at the national level, the same degree? We see some responses here and there, but it's not systematic. And we need to have a much, much more systematic response to what is really a humanitarian tragedy. You know, the silent voices of all these people. It's a, really a humanitarian tragedy. In the back, last question. Yeah, Arun Lewis from Indo Asian News Service. You mentioned about reparation for victims of uh, terrorism. Uh, in the case of uh, state-sponsored acts of terrorism, do you think uh, states should be held responsible for providing reparation? And if so, do you foresee the possibility of developing a mechanism to enforce that? You're talking about victims of terrorism, yes. reparations. And, and yes, this is one of the state-sponsored terrorism. Ah, state-sponsored. No, look again. We're coming down to the issue of, of definitions. You know, I can't. You know, we're not. We're, we're not. As, as I keep explaining, it's very sincerely, we're not talking about um, definitions of terrorism in that sense. We're talking about state-sponsored, um, because that certainly is not something here at the United Nations, uh, in any body of the UN, as far as I'm aware of, is is, is a term that's accepted by member states. The idea of state-sponsored terrorism. Um, so we're looking at, in this conference, and again, I come back to this conference in terms of the individual and the, uh, including in the third session, I believe there's going to be a whole uh, se session devoted to 
What do we do when it comes to reparation for acts of terrorism? And we're not talking here of state-sponsored as you have you defined it. Um, in fact, there are efforts already to implement the, what's known as the basic principles and guidelines on the right to a remedy and reparation for victims of gross violations of international human rights law and serious violations of international humanitarian law, and how these measures, which are more broad, can be used for measures to support victims of terrorism. So there is a general framework for, for um, you know, reparations, guidelines actually, for remedy and, and reparation for victims of gross violations of human rights law and human ra humanitarian law, but it hasn't been specifically targeted to victims of terrorism. Uh, so that's something that is going to be, in fact, the third session tomorrow. And I encourage all of you to please, if you have the time, to, to cover it. And hopefully, because I think you, when it comes to victims' stories, are being the biggest allies. If you weren't even talking about that, nobody else would. So I think for you to cover this conference, I see the press and the media have an extremely important role in terms of the advocacy for what is really, as I said, the, the, the missing human face of, of terrorism. We really need to give that much, much more prominence. Great. Thank okay. you very much, Jahangir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Great. That was good.